Yeah. Hey, there's Chris Hardy and Greg, is that you as well? Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Welcome, Greg. Hey. How's it going? Oh, we just had Leanne down here to hang on. Let me shut this off. I've got to. Yeah, just uh, had Leanne down here and she got to get oriented to the seed project. She's going to be coming in as the the uh, carrier for our Estancia Seed Bank and Seed Temple. So uh, very exciting. Oh, good. She joined the Army. Very good. Very good. The Green Beret. <laughs> You're going to let a liberal into that position? <laughs> well, we're working on that. <laughs> well, you know what? I think we should all just keep working on that. You know, that's the whole yeah. idea. America is a yeah. place where we can work on that. You know, we're all on, the, yeah. the, on this side of the for. wall. So, so we might as well try to work it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, the seeds are the bridge. Mm. You, if you just stick with the seeds, you can't go wrong. You know, I learned that from you, and I have so much respect, so thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 And Chris Hardy, how are you doing out there in the great Northwest? Are you muted? Yeah, you're muted. Oh, he's muted. By design. Who's, there he is. Who's that? There he is. Hey, Chris, it's Leanne. I was just welcoming you and wondering how you're doing in the great Northwest. Ah, uh, hi, y'all. Um, yeah, things are coming along. It's been such an interesting season. Been super mild and warm and dry. We had basically two months of steady no rain, no snow, no nothing. And um, the rains finally showed up here over the past couple of weeks. So we're, we're getting caught up on moisture, which is really good because our grains were really struggling. We were having some uh, yield reductions and uh, I'd love to share a little bit about our experience with our, our grain trials on two different plots in Southern Oregon. But um, the rains have arrived and so I think we're gonna be able to say that we've dry farmed uh, over uh, close to 40 varieties of grains, winter Dover grains, dry farmed. Wow. 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 Nice. And some of them performed well, it sounds like. You're... Oh, oh, all of them. I think across wow. the board, everything has, has exceeded our greatest expectations. We had a couple of varieties. I wish I had notes in front of me. Uh, a rye that didn't pull through and a wheat um wise that was of the 33 that we got from rocky mountain um uh 31 looked just incredible solid stand um just it's gonna be a little bit of uh figuring out when the timing and when things you know just just the efficiency of scale is a little bit of a concern of just just uh like when to get the harvest done and so that it doesn't take forever as you guys probably understand some of you that grow large diversity of things it's all the little details add up uh to a lot of time that you know just even labeling things and you know it's a lot of start stop start stop and that's one thing that i that we're not a stranger to because we grow such great diversity with uh with our seed company but the hardy seeds but it it's the grains just add another layer of, of uh, to that and, and just keeping things squared away. Definitely open for any wisdom on the call here, how we're going to be able to keep everything segregated and, and make sure that we get some of the, the seed back to Rocky Mountain for the, to perpetuate the seed. And, and, um, and dang, yeah, what a ride. Looking forward to how to process it and and soak it and sprout it and eat it and taste it and share it and get these these seeds um, out as part, part of the bigger Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance vision. And so grateful. Oh, Chris, that's awesome. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it's so grateful. Thank you. So grateful for you and your work on that. 40 varieties um, and the 33 from us that we kind of 
danced getting to you and uh, I'm really pleased to hear that it really worked out and um, yeah that harvest piece is a big one. Greg is here he um, could probably share some of his wisdom with all of the trials that he's done for grains and, and things for us and for the greater world. And Dr. Bradley Tonison is here and he's working on some trials and you've got the RMSA crew. So it seems like a great time to talk about some of this. Bill, do you want to? Yeah. Lead? Well, you know, I was thinking that I was thinking about it because I started harvesting mine. And that's, a, you're exactly right. I started thinking though of the kinds of systems I'm going to need. First, the equipment, you know, my own small scale stuff. So for equipment for me, it's going to be a box that's about um, three feet wide and four feet long with about a two or three inch edge around it. I'm going to build it and with uh, hardware cloth in the bottom. And that, I learned that from uh, uh, the Dr. Uh, Ralph Bush at the, teaches at the Air Force Academy, who grows all his own bread grains in his backyard. And he just found that if he, there was a little bit of hardware cloth in the bottom of you know, his little wooden box, then he could just throw everything in there and stomp on it real quick, and it would thresh it for him really easily. And so that, you know, I'm, so I'm working on that, but I need a station to do that. And then I, uh, I just winnowed. So I set up a big tarp and I left everything up so that now I've got about nine more grains to go. So as I'm going through, I'm thinking about all nine of them, but I'm, I'm setting up each station so that I can just run through and all this stuff's there for the next ones. And I, my goal is to do one a day. That's about all I can handle. I get up early in the morning and do one a day. So you're right, Chris, you know, setting up systems is going to be it. And I was wondering about, um, you know, who must have done this? And this is what I was thinking is John Shirk, you know, because he had, he was doing so many of them and he was so systematic about his photos, especially here. I'll show you. So I took this photo yesterday. Um, I'm those of you that are on there and I'll show you, uh, this is definitely a John Shirk idea. So this is one of my stations. To, oh, nice. Is to take then three or four heads and put them together on a nice background and take some of the seeds and put it next to it. It's sort of an archival. That's you know. very cool. Bill. Right. So that's one of the stations. And so, Chris, this is the one other thing I would say is uh, photographs, photographs, photographs. If you can get them in all different stages, you know, we're a visually driven society. And if we can get, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. like, this is black and tan. I'm showing a picture of black and tan einkorn that free threshes. So I didn't mm. have to dehull it. This is my new favorite grain. I'm in love. And I get in it. I thought you might be. Oh my God. It's just incredible. So. When that it's one came holus, from it was, it's yes, holus. It's holus. A holus wow. icon. And big it was just seeds. Oh, it's holus. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> oh. So, uh, Leanne, I have about wow. 280 grams that I'll send you. Nice. Okay. That's great because we had just, you know, that tiny little bit on that one. Yeah. That's so this great. is a holus one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. wow. Super cool. Are you sure? Have you had it, uh, had it tested? Have you had a PCR? Um, this is a, another conversation. I don't know if you guys know Oregon CBD, Seth and Eric Crawford in Oregon that are producing world-class, but in conversation with him up at the Sea Growers Conference, uh, he was one of our guest speakers at the OSA's uh, biannual seed conference, uh, spoke on the hemp seed production, and he offered, was offering to send equipment down to Southern Oregon or or, or send something up to him to have it tested for a PC, to have a PCR test for genetics. And um, he said without that, they wouldn't be where they are today because looking at all these different traits, you know, we know the challenges with hemp and the THC levels, uh, federally legal, uh, less than 0.3%. Uh, and now they've dropped that number to even uh, more stringent and so it's there they said that 
without running the PCR test, they wouldn't be able to tell that basically to get there, the only way to be able to do it would be able to basically GMO uh, CRISPR, GMO hemp. And he's, he's very skeptical about even Monsanto, Bayer, any of these guys saying they could even take all the THC out because from what he's looked at with the PCR testing and the genetics that they've been able to look at with this equipment, it basically saying that the THC and the CBD of which everybody, uh, you know, most people are growing at CBD, uh, these components are, are stuck to the THC gene. Uh, and you cannot pull that off of there. You no longer have hemp, or you no longer have a viable CBD. Again, as people are processing the hemp for. And I think it'd be really interesting to um, come up with a plan of how we can do this with, uh, just for a deeper understanding of the grains, not that we have to have it, but I would really like to know, like, what is it in the einkorn that, uh, you know, what's the strain, the ancient strain? We're growing uh, several varieties of einkorn, and we've seen different, different things going on, different traits. Black einkorn, even two varieties, they're, they're, they behave differently. They, uh, they grow at different rates and mature at different rates. There's just something, even though they look identical, and the one being holus, uh, you know, what's the closest cousin to that? And, I don't know if that would help us, but might give us some insight if we ever need that cap uh, that capability. It's it's there. Bradley, do you want to comment? What is a PCR test? <laughs> oh sure. Um, so the PCR test, yeah, I guess what they use for the hemp, um, they're probably looking at a certain. So there's. There's a few genes, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of genes that contribute to the pathway to make THC and CBD. And from what I understand, um, I think the pathway is the same for a while. Oh, I see. And then it branches off to make THC and it branches off to make CBD. So I think there's a lot of genes involved in CBD production that you need to keep around, even though they do make THC also. Um, but there must be a, a certain allele. So that there's, there's certain genes that make an enzyme, but then there's different alleles that will change what it does or what it looks like. And the PCR can show that. So I'm assuming it's something like that, where they're right. just, right. they're seeing if it's this allele that would produce more THC <laughs> or this other allele that wouldn't. Right. Um, so is the, test, so is the test expensive? I mean, could we do it for things like einkorn? So for the, the, that, we'd have to, um, we could look into the literature and see if there's some sort of particular gene markers to look at that, that differentiate between these different heirloom grains. I so it would be a whole different uh, right. yeah. genes in the genome that we have to look at. Right. Um, there's, there's something else you could do, which is like extract the DNA and then um, break it into fragments with specific enzymes. And if two genomes are more similar, like they're related to each other, then they will have similar fragment sizes because oh. they'll break up the same way. Oh. Um, kind of a shortcut. So, yeah. 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 So they're called, they're called restriction fragment length polymorphisms. Okay. <laughs> and, hey, um, thank you. And they, <laughs> and so, that that could be interesting then you could it would be pretty expensive this kind of stuff takes yeah. like a lot of lab equipment right um but to contract it out might not be so bad right uh something to look into okay. but you could you could you could make a family tree of all these grains if you wanted to yeah so so chris what do you yeah. think you know you're the one who suggested it um you know, what we're doing is we don't have lab equipment and most, you know, farmers and gardeners don't have the money to do this kind of testing. So, you know, what we what we fall back on is the fact that it worked, right? I found a new grain that I'm passionate about 
because it did free thresh. It's an einkorn and it's absolutely beautiful. It seemed to yield well. It was about five feet tall, works in my climate. Um, and so that's good enough for me. I'm gonna make bread, you know, and I'm gonna pass it around. We'll see if it works in other places. I mean, at some point, if you wanna go commercial with it, you know, are there other people involved in putting a million dollars behind, you know, growing it out big for uh, some sort of industrial idea? Then I think lab tests start to make sense. But what I've always liked about seed saving is that we can keep it at a small and relatively immediate level and still do the kind of selection work and find the kinds of things that work for us. And so that's what, what I was hoping to convey in, in my in my einkorn. That I found one. I this is probably. I don't know, Leanne, I've probably grown 40 different grains here. Mm -hmm. And just in overall, you know, mm -hmm. excitement, this is my grain so far. So <laughs> although I do like Harani, just the way it looks, you know. I feel like a matchmaker in my job. Because when that one came in, I was like, oh, Bill's going to fall in love with this. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I had no idea. Boy, it is just incredible. And I just want to point out, um, and thank you, but um, for your comments on that, Brad, I think it's interesting to learn more about that and Chris, some of the things that we could consider or, or that growers could consider. I want to share the little bit. I did send the link and I also posted, I sent it directly to you, Chris, because it looks like you might be on a phone and not seeing the links here in the chat box. But this one came from Sweden. And um, I received it from Kevin Payne and John Shirk, who work together. And Kevin Payne is in, in California. He is an incredible grain resource. The guy is so uh, knowledgeable uh, with his hands-on experience and observation and really tuned in. And so he's further selected this from, although it was already, um, it looks like John Shirk received it because of that free threshing uh naked characteristic that was his interest he says there's a lot of work yet to do with it but that there's a lot of potential he thinks for farmers homesteaders and bakers check out the site and i'm kind of reading from the site but what's not on there is that um kevin payne has been this great source for us and has been further selecting these grains with our program in mind and i'm um anyway so i guess that might be something though that you'd like to try in the future on your next round of trials Is he, is he, oh, here, and I oh, do yeah. know that Greg Shane has some um, a similar. Box. Yes, please. Okay, cool. Help <laughs> yes, me remember. <laughs> Help me remember. Hey, Greg, do you want to talk about this? Just since we're on that topic of um, cleaning smaller trial um, quantities and and process, and you seem to be really good at process from my perspective. And so, could you share about? The you mean box? like when you're when you. Oh, yeah, similar to what Bill was talking about, I have these uh, seed plats that I'm, I, it's kind of like a dual use thing. It's like a, you know, about, I make these things that are about the size of a, like a seed flat, maybe, maybe 13, 14 inches by, you know, 21 inches. And they're, they've got a, uh, they've got the hardware cloth, like the half inch hardware cloth on the bottom, and then some little strips underneath. And I use those for, growing things where you want to have air root pruning. Uh, and, uh, but when I'm not using them for that, they're really good for thrashing. And I just taken kind of like what Bill was saying, you just, instead of like walking into them, I just take and do it by hand because I do smaller amounts and you can, you can uh, uh, crush up those heads and then you go ahead and winnow them out. And how do you keep it'll track let you do of all some, your It varieties? lets you do small amounts. What's that? How do you keep track of all your varieties when you're doing like a, you know, a bunch of... Hang, oh, hang on just a second. Are you there? Yeah, I just, I had a little interruption there. Yeah, uh, we're here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. well, I just do each one and, 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 uh, you know, I have my, all my, my, uh, bags or boxes with, uh, the harvest on them and I just I just uh, do them one at a time and then separate that out and you know clean it up and put it into whatever I'm putting it into a little jar or a bag and uh, and keep all my labeling straight but one of the things I want to really emphasize is because kind of like what we're doing in 
this uh, seed bank that we've been doing here in Estancia, New Mexico, is getting volunteers to grow some of our different uh, different seed in our collection. That's that's pretty rare. And the idea of growing uh, things in small spaces where most people may just have like a a residential yard, a small amount of space, maybe not a lot of experience. The grains are amazingly easy to do. And um, if you just, you know, follow a few certain uh, guidelines uh, and and be aware of if it's a spring planted or a fall planted, and uh, you can really do some nice stuff. And I just, when I first started doing grains, I just remembered back to being on the wheat harvest when I was 19 and how I, I remembered how far apart those rows were and they were 12 inches apart. And so I just started doing my little rows about seed about an inch apart, about half inch deep, 12 inches apart. And then when the, when the plants grow, their canopies just meet, you know, when they tiller out and when they expand and, you know, before they, they uh, completely go to maturity, they're 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 occupying that space just perfectly. They're not crowding out, and yet they're not you're not wasting space. And and then with that uh, distance apart, it's real easy if you want to supplemental water them because the, you can just water right between them. And uh, you can also if you got a lot of trouble with you know a harsher environment, you can mulch you know uh, in between there. And so you can do little plots, maybe five by five foot by six feet or something like that. I do everything in, I tend to do everything in blocks and you can do anywhere from like four to six, four foot by six feet to, you know, eight foot by 10 feet, depending on how much you want to grow and, and how, if you're trying to increase the seed and you can get a nice, you know, a nice healthy little grow out from these little spaces. So I really want to emphasize that for the people out there that, no people that want to grow seed get them into the grains because they're, they're it's very rewarding it's easy to do you're going to get re good results and uh you know you get to watch something that you thought oh i can only i only thought grain had to be in a giant field but it doesn't and you can do it and uh so that's the, that's the thing that really impressed me about doing this is it is it's uh it's a thing that that a lot of a lot of people that are just getting into growing things could do very easily well said. And I had just the pleasure of seeing yeah. your trials there, Greg. I was just trying to actually picture load it onto my computer to screen share. It was really neat how, if you don't mind, if I share that picture of you in front of that next to the Harani and in front of the oh. circle oh, okay. garden. It was a okay. really cool setup and I'll show it to you though. You know, it honestly doesn't do justice of, of the way that garden's set up. I, I, yeah. But I'll show you. But um, I liked your point on how the blocks, I loved seeing the way that you block plant those um, in a different sort of fashion. And he's growing Harani Bill. That's just beautiful. It, he started it, Greg, you said February out there in Estancia? No, no, this one, no, all this stuff was around the 4th of April. Remember how late we April. got that seed? Yeah, okay. so it's, it's really pushing it. And one of the things we're, we're learning from this is uh, you the one of the problems with pushing it later anywhere, and but we just didn't have any choice. Uh, so a lot of the stuff, and even since you were there a few couple of days ago, the grasshopper. We have a big grasshopper uh, infestation going on right now, and uh, and they are you know if I had planted this stuff in the early March, I, it would already been harvested. But because we had to do it later. Uh, then we had this batch of grasshoppers show up about 10 days ago, and they finally figured out that they like to eat the leaves off the grain. <laughs> so they're they're going after it. But the good news is is probably three or four of them that were further along. They're not bothering them that much. But th that's just data. You know, that's what happens. You know, you get into heat stress, and you know the heat, the warmer time of the year, they're just more susceptible. And then the timing with when the grasshoppers just showed up in mass all at once. Uh, you know, if you if you can get in before that, then you're good. Cause that's a summertime bug that comes in, you know. But uh, yeah, but it's I, data, I mean, even if you have something that doesn't work, it's data, yeah. 
Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Leanne, I made you a co-host so you can share your picture. Okay, good. It hasn't come in yet. I've got a slow, right. but I'll uh, do that All once right. it does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the bugs getting a hold of the grains. Um, we just see, uh, put out some millet. Millet, uh, was it? Yeah. Let's see here. This yeah. is finger millet. Looks fine, but the, yeah. the uh, sorry, the foxtail millet looks fine, but the finger millet perpetually, we've been growing finger millet for several and nearly seems the Ooh, I think I lost you. Have this tendency to just show up by the armies of mm, a million at a time. And, yeah. they, you know, you lift open a board, throw, throw yep. the board over, and there's like a, a million earwigs underneath this board. But they just eat wow. the finger millet. But they don't yeah. eat the foxtail millet or the like. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Wow. I don't know what it is. The sugars, the sugars are higher in the. We've done it in flats, and the, the the earwigs will come right up up at nighttime into the greenhouse, up onto the nursery wow. tables, and they will just chew and munch and just decimate flats full of of the. Uh, I've got pictures of this too happy to send, but it, they chew it almost down to the ground. You know, one inch wow. tall, they come back, and the leaves are just all totally chewed. Wigs. So I don't know, you know, challenges like that really tend to put a damp in someone's spirit for growing. I can tell you, I'm getting kind of at the end of my rope Man. on growing finger millet i'm like okay just wow. there's too many yeah we we have earwigs everywhere and you ain't gonna get rid of wow. earwigs ever and so whoa what's n next pearl millet and, and yeah and oh i think i lost them millet we yeah Yeah, I think Zoom has an interesting algorithm where it tries to stretch out the <laughs> signal. Oh, is that happening to everybody else? I thought it was yeah. my connection. No, it's no, like, it's happening. To everything all. gets all stretched. It's like yeah. it's going through a, a noodle yeah. machine or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got most of it, Chris. Damn. You know, okay, I, good. Yeah. You know, it makes me, you know, um, I have a, you know, I've, the thing I've learned here is that I have a hard time growing things through the middle of the summer. And yeah. after about 10 years, I finally stepped back. You know, you have one of those moments and you go, what are you trying to do? You know what works here in the summer? Corn, squash, and beans and chili. You know, those are the Southwest crops. That's why people don't try to grow yeah. millet and all, you know, I mean, although millet seems to go pretty well here, but you know, it made me think, so what are the, you know, uh, going back a hundred years, Chris, what are the crops that work there? I mean, somebody's been through this stuff and has probably figured it out. I don't know. Uh, you know, so you're in, it's such a sweet spot where so many things grow, but maybe millet's just not it, or maybe one of the other millets. And I guess my question would be, have you tried phonio, which is even another millet that's coming out of Africa that's supposed to be really uh, drought tolerant? What's it called? Phonio, F-O-N-I-O, and reputedly, mm, wow. it's a small Better. seed, yeah. and reputedly, it grows yeah. without any water. Wow. Wow. F-O-N-I-O? Yeah. Wow, can, I'll look that up. Wow. You can get some of the, the, the uh, USDA has some seeds, you know, in the in the seed bank for wow. it. Um, and there are a few being passed around. Um, I, I went on a real search about a year ago and finally, I think it was Joe Simcox told me that he saw pounds of it being sold in uh, a market, uh, African market in LA. 
somewhere downtown. Wow. And so here I was trying to get 50 seeds. I think that's what I got from the USDA is 50 seeds. Or I got 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think some John Shirk or somebody sent me half theirs. And um, and so we're, you know, we're we're dealing in, you know, counting out the seed by seed. And and somebody said, Oh yeah, it's a food and you can buy it in a in an African market in uh West African market in LA. So I don't know. I'd love to see more people wow. try it because I think there's lots more adventures like that to have too. Um, I got yeah, a quick question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go for it. Please. <laughs> um, for Greg, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've worked with rice before and they pretty much self. So, you can grow multiple varieties next to each other and save the seed and be confident that it's different. But with these this is heritage rice, grains, you said? Yeah. rice, yeah. yeah. But yeah. with the heritage grains, can you, can you put blocks right next to each other of these different varieties and be confident that you're saving the seed from each of them and it's still just that variety or do they cross? Well, what I did, I mean, Rye is real bad about crossing between varieties, uh, and uh, the barleys and the wheats aren't really too bad. But what I do is I, I take the barley, I alternate between the the wheat and the barley if I have them next to each other, so that there's a little more of a, of a, um, you know, of a, of a barrier there. But uh, rye, if you're if you're working with rye, you're going to have a little more trouble. Uh, oats, I'm I'm not sure. I I haven't done much of that. I I did some of the wild feral oats last year just for fun, but uh, but rye is the one that you're going to have a little more trouble with it hybridizing. So you want to keep that separated. Yeah. And okay. didn't some of the guys at the bread lab out there who were just like growing everything like a huge uh, crazy quilt of six thousand kinds they didn't have any trouble at all <laughs> oh. yeah Brad, they had was, just little patches of everything yeah i, I was going to try to grow up a picture that um steve jones um, oh yeah here sh showed us i can't I, i'm i'll, I'll try i'll to stop sharing but i'll just point out really quickly so this yeah, it's, yeah again, let's do greg's yeah. i don't have greg in the right position here to show the grain as well as I'd like. Um, he's actually in front of, Greg, it's the picture in front of the kale, which was also having an infestation. Yeah. Harlequin yeah. bugs picked off. And I can that send you a better <laughs> shot. I, I can send you a good shot of that one before the grasshoppers too. It'll look a lot better if you want. I got yeah. pictures. I've been taking pictures and of all that and then, stuff. Yeah. So in this, the circle behind him, those are blocks side by side of grain. And I think you were saying you were doing wheat, barley, wheat, bar barley around the circle. Yeah, I kept them alternating if, if I could, yeah. And the timing has been real, you know, they, there's some of them were a lot earlier than others in coming out. So they, 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 they segregated by timing too, yeah, yeah. And now I'm showing the picture of the Harani. I don't know if you're wa viewing this, Greg, that's why I'm mentioning oh no i'm on here. just a phone yeah. yeah yeah i'm actually walking over okay. to it right now <laughs> or maybe i can telepathically send a picture oh, nice. to you all <laughs> i'm looking yeah, at we'll it right now yeah cool. that one doesn't seem to be getting bothered by the grasshopper so i'm really glad because i really wanted to get some increase in seed on that one the harani and it looks good and uh yeah uh, i'll just share for a second can you guys see that? Woo, yeah. yeah. So Bradley, that's ten. Okay. They grew ten thousand varieties one year. These are all wheat. Yeah. Um, and Steve wow. Jones said um, he could not find physical evidence of a cross. <laughs> Just yeah. And he's head of. He's <laughs> yeah. the PhD head of the program. And what he did say then, and this is why I like him, is, um, boy, we wish they would cross. <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be fun? you know, to see what they could come up with. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah. wheats and barleys, um, no problems they've, that they've had. Yeah. And the neat thing about grain is that, you know, on the scale they're growing it then the next year for the ones that he carries forward in their trials. Um, 
he said we would be able to recognize almost immediately in that second generation if there had been crosses because they're also uni you know they're relatively uniform so i don't yeah. know i i love that idea so in breeding they have to they have to meticulously hand pollinate don't they when oh, they do yeah. different breeding programs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he's not doing that there. What they've been, you know, they're, he has 30,000 varieties to search through. What they're trying to do is find the best bread wheat for yeah. the Skagit Valley. So I said, so Steve, what kind of yeah. data do you keep, you know, on the trials during the year? And he goes, me? None. <laughs> I get up early every morning and walk through there. And so I said, so what's the criteria for your selection? He said, we, you know, I kept... 19 of them to go on for my, wow. my particular. And I said, so what's yeah. the criteria? And he goes, are you kidding me? I loved them. They jumped up and shouted at me. They were the ones I really yeah. wanted. He said, that's it. You know, that's what we have to do is go back to that kind of selection again. And he said, and then he winked at me and said, oh yeah, I've got graduate students. They do all the data. <laughs> mm -hmm. He says, we, we, you know, the whole program itself, because it's part of the university, keeps incredible data on them. So he, he has the luxury of not having to do that. But, but that's what I'm doing. And that's, that was, tonight was the, the black and tan einkorn. It jumped up at me. Wow. And how tall did you say that was? Like four feet high? Um, no, five. five oh my feet. God, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Closer to five. Yeah. You know, and that's a disadvantage for some people. This Harani yeah. is only about three feet tall. You know, and. You know what? It's only two, it's only 24 inches for me. Yeah. It's really tight. Yeah. It's, it, uh, when I grew it last year well what i've got now is 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 like that and what i did last year is like that yeah it's ours, real healthy looking stuff and then it only gets about two feet high yeah yeah ours is consistently every year been about uh 30 inches high and i i just wonder yeah, okay. from variety to variety a little less a little more but i would say you know a question for me is how much fertility What's the fertility of the soils? And if you understand the nature yeah. of the einkorn uh, as weeds, essentially weeds, uh, dang, it's like if, if you can use less, less inputs, is that not where we want to be selecting? Yeah, that's true. Here, I'll show you. We, we've been talking, Harani, I'll show you a picture, everybody, if it'll come up. Yeah, Chris, are you taking pictures? Woohoo, that's beautiful. Ah. Wow. And then I have, let's see, I could probably. Uh... Yeah, a lot of pictures for sure. It's almost overwhelming, like just to keep everything. Usually I take a picture of the end stake, the end bed, and then take pictures of the variety. Uh, everything that, you know, from the height, try to stand yeah, next yeah. to okay. it. Okay. And so, cause otherwise going back, it's like you can't tag or put keywords on these things of the varieties. So it gets complicated. It's like, well, what photo is that on, on my hand? And then put my hand up next to it and take a photo. If you just want to take a picture of the head or just take a picture of the stakes at the end of the bed and then go in and take several snaps of the variety then go to the next one, take a picture of the end stake on the bed, et cetera. And it's a lot of photos. <laughs> you know what I did? Wow, nice. For the first time, this is becoming part of my system, is that I, um, I, when I harvested, I pulled the stake and uh, brought it with me. So then I did bunches, like I showed you a picture, and I put the stake next to it with a tape measure. So I've got pictures so we can go back later and measure the height. And then when I was um, uh, threshing it, whatever, and I took some pictures, I just carried the stake all the way through it. You know, so I'm gonna do better stakes next time with really, you know, nice or lettering on them so I can actually read it. <laughs> and, and, nice. and have that follow it through all the way through the process. You know, so I don't get things mixed up. I don't know, this is gonna be really interesting. <laughs> that was eye candy, Bill.
<laughs> well, we've um, talked grains. You're in good company if you like grains right now. But I see that we have Julie and John here that we haven't heard from. Are there any questions that either of you have on your minds or is anything you want to share that bef before we... Um, yeah, get on to more grain stuff. <laughs> oh, I did have a question for Bill. Um, Bill, you were talking about how you had the, uh, you know, you, you had trouble growing things in the summer because that's a, you know, quite a bit hotter climate. And I remember when I lived in Cottonwood, I, I tried growing some corn and that was when I learned about how the heat will prevent it from setting. But isn't a lot of that traditionally started about the time the monsoons begin? so that you're going into a little cooler right. part of the summer as things are flowering. Yeah. And then you've got that very long fall because, you know, you've got it's a while before you have a freeze Yeah. where you are. And, and so isn't that kind of the way that it's handled? They, they just plant things later and then you go into that cooler phase there as yeah. it's maturing and flowering. You know, so that, yeah. yeah. That's you know, I mean, that's how the native people did it with their right. floodwater farming. Yeah. Wow. Well, the Tohon Odom, you know, if you go south of here, there's lots of stories and evidence of that. Right around here, there, I, I have yet to find any direct stories from the people that actually yeah. grew here. So we don't know for sure. But I grew oh, okay. corn. Yeah. I grew four crops of corn for seed one summer here. I planted yeah. uh, May 1st, June 1st. July 1st, and then I, I was wow. desperate and planted a crop August 1st. And the August yeah. 1st, I'd actually had started them in flats about three weeks before yeah. that. So I set them out August yeah. 1st, and I wanted everything to be yeah. you know spaced so they wouldn't cross. And I got corn. I call it corn on the karma. Yeah. You've got to pray a lot, yeah, right. you know, yeah. at the end especially. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and, but they all worked. They all worked. And yeah. so I'm not sure we know. And I know that down in Tucson, we started mixing up when we were planting stuff. There's all sorts of stories of, of fall planting and, you know, going through the winter there. Yeah. And then early spring planting yeah. and then monsoon planting. Right. So I, yeah. you know, I'm just trying to figure it yeah. out myself now. But year in, year yeah. out, even through the hot, the corn, squash, and beans work for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, carrots don't work <laughs> very yeah, well. No, they need to like the cool weather. <laughs> Rub, rhubarb, cut. <laughs> There's no rhubarb here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So anyway. Yeah, well, you guys can do an incredible, uh, well, especially down around Phoenix, you can do all those incredible greens during the winter, you know, cool season stuff. And, yeah. Oh, man. You know, I see people with pots full of, giant kale all over the place there in the winter yeah well i sure was surprised on how well your kale was doing out there in the middle of that heat and wind greg that was amazing uh, i think we got the harlequin bugs under control i think we got them uh, I, uh you know I, uh, those are usually really hard to deal with but we uh, we jumped on them and i i checked them this morning and Last last night I picked a few off, but they're they're I think we got it handled. That's a tough one to deal with those harlequin bugs. You were right on it. On that note, the challenges I can't believe we actually got a quinoa to germinate uh, <laughs> after the first uh, the middle of June. Freaking amazing wow. i'm looking at almost solid germination right now of a couple of beds i'm really stoked about wow. that we were on to a variety that does really well for us in, in southern oregon will even pollinate through 95 degree temperatures as wow. we've had for weeks and weeks on end and still we ended up wow. with heads and heads full of quinoa so wow. i you know the um there are a lot of challenges, but I think we just need to be good note takers and just know like, hey, 
this is your champion for the hot weather stuff. I forget we were, it's yeah. Oro de Valle. It's this anchored quinoa. It's so beautiful. We grew last year. Uh, it was an exceptionally cool year last year. So maybe why we got uh, uh, such, such productivity. But come to find out after threshing it, the, the size of the grain was very small, if not in, incomplete. And yeah. so there's more than meets the eye to the, you know, the pictures of what we were sharing out to people like, look how beautiful this or the ballet is. But then a little bit more research here the past few weeks as we we're preparing to plant, that's not your hot weather champion. And so we, whatever seed that yeah. did produce from last year, we kind of just yeah. shelved it. And I don't know if we're ever going to grow wow. that one again. Wow. That's amazing. We've had so many trialists interested in quinoa and I haven't been successful, so I haven't been a great guide on that, but I would, I'm um, wondering if you would share some of that with the grain trials. It sounds like a good, yeah. good one to get. Sure, sure. It's the redhead that we got it from Frank, directly from Frank uh, Morton, okay. and we've been growing it for 11, 12 years here in Southern Oregon in our, in our hot climate, much a fair degree warmer than up in the Willamette Valley where Frank uh, came up with that one. And I, so again, it's, I know it to be other champion, happy to share some of yeah, and what I'm realizing with the trials and, and talking with Greg and everyone that it'd be really nice to have you all as resources when people are, um, you know, again, that's one that I haven't been successful with and I'd love it if I could say, and I know you're really busy, but hey, talk to Chris about it. So anyway, we can talk more about that off this call, but in the spirit of connecting our seed stewards, I'd like to see more of that happening. I'd like to chime in on the quinoa. Uh, you know, since it's a, a day length sensitive plant, if you if you plant some late in the summer, like even around early August, and get it uh, get it going, you'll have it flower and 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 mature only at about a foot high, and uh, it accelerates that flowering. If you're just trying to increase some seed. You know, kind of quick increase some seed, not really get a big yield, but but get some seed, get it going late, and going into short days, it'll just want to flower. In fact, you could probably even grow it in a greenhouse situation, and uh, and have little plants like six inches high, totally maturing with with heads on them. Uh, but but just a later planting where you're getting through that, kind of getting out of that really hot weather then you've got uh you got it making seed when it's just really short and that's just sort of a thing that you know especially for people living in a pretty warm area where they can't really do a a regular crop of it if they're just trying to do some seed you can play around with that timing like that and uh and and you know it'll you go into those short days and it just wants to start flowering real fast hmm. well wow, that's good to know Tricks of the trade. Yeah, just, yeah. Well, Brad, how are the chili trials going? Anything to report on those? They're pretty good. Um, it's coming along pretty well this season. Um, not a lot to report. I mean, they have, they just started to flower. Uh, we won't be harvesting for another two, three months. Um, but another thing to note in terms of seed, we, uh, we're doing some trials on lettuce, actually, and some, some head lettuce. So we're in this project that I'm starting up, which is helping farmers be their own seed savers and do some on-farm breeding. Um, we have this participatory project and I was testing out some varieties of lettuce to see which ones are the most heat tolerant. And so I'm down in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it's it's over 100 degrees now most days. And we planted some lettuce really late to see, you know, which ones wouldn't bolt, 
and still would taste pretty good. And we found a few and we're just staking them up and letting them bolt now, pulling out the ones that are bolting a little early so we can maybe move those genetics towards a little more heat tolerance. And we're saving seed from all these good varieties. And we're gonna share it with these six farmers around that wanna try this lettuce out. R pretty much to extend their season so they can sell head lettuce at the farmer's market more like in the middle of the summer when everyone would actually like to have some more salad. So that's been fun. That's exciting. Which varieties, if you don't mind, you know, we did, um, if you oh, yeah. don't remember any of them, we did some trials in Southern Idaho where it was um, consistently a hundred mm -hmm. in the Snake mm -hmm. River Plain in the summertime. And um, the one that was best for us, I'll just pass it on, was Ithaca. It's an old open pollinated um, crisp head lettuce. And it was developed years ago. And for some reason it ended up being the most heat tolerant lettuce of all the lettuces we were growing actually. So. Huh. Yeah, we have a, a few that might be popular, but some of them I actually, I brought from California from the farm I was at. And they were saving seed from those lettuce for almost 30 years. So it was in Sacramento. So it was, it's almost a similar climate. It gets really hot there. And we tried those out. They've been doing pretty good. We have a variety from some people that were doing a little breeding for heat tolerance in Hawaii. And those are turning out good too. So yeah, it's kind of a, a mixed bag of everything and we're seeing what happens. <laughs> you know, when we had John Navasio on, he was saying, you know, he, what he's doing is pushing it the other way. You know, his, his mantra in his trials is give them hell. If they don't kill half of what they're trialing, then they're not doing a good job. <laughs> they're trying to, and they're looking for cold tolerance. And so he said, since he's been there at Johnny's, They've taken the major uh, crops that he's working on, uh, spinach being the primary one, um, moved it 10 degrees in its tolerance, colder. So, you wow. know, if you could do that with lettuce and heat, man, that would be great. So I, I'm just getting inspired by what you're doing because that's really a, a worthy thing to be working on. Yeah, we just planted this second round to test out a couple weeks ago and so it's been hot for them their whole life and and we're just yeah we're pushing it because they're already starting to bolt but some of them are holding out so i think we'll have a few good ones mm -hmm. so would you ascribe you know so it's, it's some of this is uh as we uh, you know from your lecture could we use the uh, the uh, epigenetic language around this I mean, not only are you selecting, right? By if you grow them in really, really hot weather and it's killing half your lettuce and some mm -hmm. of them make it and some of them don't bolt. I mean, in some senses, what you're doing is selecting out genetics that are already there, right? But you're also subjecting them to huge stress that they may then be able to carry forward. So it's both those things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is both. Mm -hmm. So I'm... I'm hoping, because what I want to do next year is take the seed we saved right. and plant it alongside the seed back from the source, like what we right. planted this year. Right. And if there's a generational change, right. I mean, that's going to be a little genetic, but also epigenetic, like they were right. primed to handle this heat. Right. Um, so that'll be interesting to see if that works. Are there any documented um, studies of people doing that, trying to look at epigenetic change after huge stress and how many years it might take to start to recognize real change? You know, there's, there's some papers that really look into it and they, they see change in a generation. Okay. And then they see, they see the change help them be tolerant. Like let's say if it's a pest, they, they could be tolerant, more tolerant to that pest for five generations down. Like if you, wow. if you, um, if you show them to a pest and some are more tolerant and they survive and you save that seed, 
and then you don't introduce that pest for another five generations, those are still showing more tolerance than the seed that didn't see anything that first generation. Wow. So it's an intergenerational inheritance of this, this trauma, this stress and wow. Yeah. Does, so they see it. Mm -hmm. Does it work with gophers? <laughs> 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 I wish. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm having gopher problems. <laughs> so that's fascinating about the pests, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. So the next time the, the, the grasshoppers come, Greg, you should say, come on in. Come on, you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're growing good. We're going to have five generation payoff from you guys. So just yeah. get, get in there right now. Yeah, they they seem to have a taste for certain things, and then they kind of discover, oh, I can eat that too. No, oh, I can eat that too. But it something does hold them off for a while. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, that's been fascinating to me in the grain trials when some people are reporting damage to one grain from something common like a grasshopper and other people aren't but the grasshoppers are going for something else so i've been trying to find the pattern whether it is like a flavor of course there are the um ons you know versus on list things like that and it's also curious how much it might be epigenetics that you know our different soils or our different i don't know any of those um influences uh yeah it might want to talk with you more about that as we get more results back not everybody tracks the pest damage but uh, m actually most people do because it's such a harrowing experience <laughs> you know i wonder if you know some of these insects right they have like decadal cycles maybe they do that just so the plants totally forget about them <laughs> wow that is yeah so, you know, you always wonder why cicadas did that, right? The 17 year cycle even, but wow, we have so much to learn about nature. I mean, every day is such a gift in my yard, even the, when I see the disasters and I'm trying to learn how to uh, look beyond all of that, you know, and that you've just given me more ammunition, you know, so, cause you know, every disaster now has another side to it to look at and, you know, I guess what I'm getting to the point, this is sort of my revelation this summer is that um, I'm going to, I decided that uh, I like Joseph Lofthouse. I can see why he's doing what he's doing. You know, I finally reached that with tomatoes this year. Last year was the first year that I can ever remember. I grew tomatoes for me to eat. I, you know, for almost 40 years, I've been growing them for seed. You know, and when you think about that, there's like between a five and fifty dollars worth of product in every tomato. You don't let anybody eat them, right? And I, had, you know, I was small and stressed, and I had all these customers, and I just never did it. But now that I'm growing tomatoes for me to eat, I realize what I have to do is what Joseph did. I've got to plant like seventy-five varieties and see which ones work best. I've, you know, there's no guessing. You don't have to, you just have to go through it. And he's doing that with every variety. He's trying to find land races and he's letting them cross if they cross. And, you know, I think that that for myself now is that I don't have a lot of years left, but with the ones I have, I'm just getting, I'm gonna have more fun messing things up and introducing more varieties into what I'm doing. So, except for my black and tan einkorn, that's sacred now, along with mother corn. Well, we're here at the seven o'clock hour. I don't know if, um, Phil, how you... No, this is fine. I think this is good. I really appreciate everybody showing up. For me, I get a lot out of this. Thank you. Bradley, thank you. Greg, thank you. Chris, loved your stories. Oh. Julie, thank you for showing up. John Kasha, we had, didn't hear from you. Love you, buddy. Renee, I hope you get better. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, and... Jackie and Leanne, I get to work with Jackie and Leanne. Um, I'm just gifted to be able to work in the same arena with you guys. You guys are doing great work, always. I'm humbled to be here. Um, if you guys haven't um, checked out our website lately, upgrades all the time. And we're just about to get our uh, Choose Your uh, Grain Varieties part back up. And I am astounded 
at the hundreds of varieties that we have available through our grain trials now. And I think, you know, thank you, Leanne. It's just a tribute to the depth and the importance of that program. I mean, when we got started in this whole thing a few years ago, you couldn't find one place to go for all those grains. And now they're available to people and it's just breathtaking. And now, oh, and uh, Bell, thank you, Bell. And we get to work with Bell <laughs> in the background. Um, uh, we are doing a seed chat next Tuesday at five o'clock. And so you could go to the Urban Farm uh, podcast and find a link for that. And or we'll be putting our social, Renee, I'm sure you'll be, be putting out social media, but I'll be on with Greg for another hour and we're doing another seat. What's that, Mel? Oh, yeah. And this, uh, this month's topic is on um, saving seeds from the hard things, uh, biennials. Thing, you know, the, the ones that are on down the road, the ones that take two years are the ones that really widely cross that you have to pay careful attention to, not like wheat. So anyway, yeah, we're going to do that. And uh, we're going to be back on next month. And I'm going to arm twist Jan Bloom into being here. And um, we've got other seed elders um, lined up. If you guys want to be back on, let me know. This thing's really open to the future, but I really appreciate it. We've got all the seed socials that we've done so far are up. Um, and Bradley, I'd like to do another one with you just to go through your epigenetics um, lecture again so that we can have another forum for that. And I've got more questions. I really appreciate all the work you're doing and what you're bringing to this whole thing because uh, um, we got a lot of uh, hard-headed scientists out there we have to uh, uh, convince. <laughs> Yeah, right. my dog. So I'm going to say goodbye. I do. <laughs> oh, oh, I think I need to mention one thing. We're working on a seed school for farmers, and it'll be an online experience. We'll probably be tapping all of you for, uh, you know, some of your information and to join us on some of that. So that will be starting in mid-September. Jackie and I are just kind of getting started on the curriculum for that. So please stay tuned for that. Thanks for coming tonight. It's really nice to see everyone out there. Thank you, yeah, thank you. You guys are awesome. Hey, have a good night. Thank you all. Take good care.